Let me welcome everyone to the first community building town hall in this series. Uh, this is the first of a series of live video events. They're going to be exploring higher education during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have a really interesting variety of folks to talk with, but the idea here is for us to have conversations, to have communication, to have reflection, discussion, argument, and concord together using this video technology. So let me explain a bit about the program, uh, and then I'll bring up our first guest. Uh, we have uh, Professor Tanya Means, who is an assistant dean as well as a director of the Teaching and Learning Center at the College of Business at the University of Nebraska. Uh, and she has been doing some fascinating work with technology and teaching. We also have uh, with us uh, a wonderful professor, uh, Andrew Feldstein, uh, who is the assistant provost for teaching innovation and learning technologies right now. And we're going to have both of them as guests in just a minute. But let me explain a bit more about how um, our whole setup works and what we hope to accomplish today. Um, to begin with, um, oh, one more person to welcome, uh, Brian Verdeen. Uh, he's the head of client success at Yellowdig. He has a good name. He spells it incorrectly, but he does make up for it with a fine hat. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing from you too, Brian. So if you haven't been to this technology before, let me just explain how it works. This is a video conferencing tool called Shindig, uh, and it's like some other video conferencing platforms you may have used, and it differs in a few others. One way is that we have a dynamic between the stage and the audience. Where I am right now and where this slide is, is called the stage, and we call it that because everyone involved in this conversation can see and hear everything that goes on the stage. And right below me, you can see a whole bunch of different um, icons, each of which represent uh, a different person or several people logging in from somewhere in the world. Uh, some of them are represented by silhouettes, some of them by video feeds, but each of them represents one more participant in our conversation. Now, if you'd like to talk to one of those people, there are a few ways of doing it. One is double click on them, and if your camera and mic are working for both of you, you can have your own audiovisual conversation right there. You can also use chat. Now, if you look at the very bottom of the screen, you should be able to see a few different buttons. And one of them, if you click on it, will let you chat with everybody else in the conversation. But there are two more powerful ways of conversing with everybody. And I want to make sure that you know about them so you can use them during the next hour. One of them is video chat, and one of them is a question and answer box. So first of all, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a strip of buttons running across it. One of the buttons is a raised hand and one of them is a question mark. If you click the raised hand, that tells us that you want to join us up here on stage. So if you have uh, your camera working, if you have your microphone working, and you're in a place where you can speak, then click that button, and when the time is right, I'll bring you right up on stage. Easy as can be. Now, if you'd rather type in a question, because perhaps you don't have sufficient bandwidth, or perhaps your mic and camera aren't working, click on that question mark button. Up will pop a little box into which you can type your question or comment. And when the time is right, I'll flash it on the screen for everyone to read, and then I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. And those are the two major ways that people participate during this conversation. Um, we have a few links I want to share with you uh, before we go further. Uh, I want to thank our sponsor, Yellowdig, who is sponsoring this series of events. Uh, you can click there for their blog on Medium or follow their YouTube channel, as well as um, on Thursday at noon, you can check out their product webinar. Um, next May 6th at 1 p.m. on a Wednesday, we'll have a follow-up webinar to this. And I want to thank Yellowdig for sponsoring it. Now that you have a sense of the technology, now that you have a sense of who's behind this, what we hope to accomplish, let me bring up one of our guests on stage. Um, this is a fantastic professor who talked to us about his work uh, using multiple technologies in teaching and learning. Professor Feldstein, greetings. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Oh, doing well. I have so many questions to ask you, but let me ask the uh, first most uh, basic one. Where are you today? I am in Hayes, Kansas. Uh, I'm assistant provost for teaching innovation and learning technologies here at Fort Hayes State University. And uh, I, since it's a fairly small town, uh, my normal work commute is about five minutes. Um, and so I am five minutes away from what is normally my office in my new makeshift home. Uh, courtesy, courtesy of Wayfair.com. 
So you really uh, shaved off that extensive commute pretty well. <laughs> yeah, very extensive. It was, it was close to close, slightly over a mile. Wow, that's a, that's a rough thing. I'm, I'm glad for the change for you. Um, let, let me ask a, a more serious question. Uh, how are you doing and how is your institution doing during this pandemic, this extraordinary moment? Um, I think our institution is doing pretty well. Uh, we have, fortunately, we've been in the online business for, for quite a while. Uh, we currently have more students that are traditionally taking classes online than are taking them face to face. So um, when we made this transition, most of our students, even our face to face students had taken some online courses. Uh -huh. Most of our faculty had taught online courses. And so despite the fact that what we're doing this semester, which I think is pretty much what most people are doing this semester, isn't going online in a strict sense of the word, we're moving towards the remote teaching model for what we're doing this semester, um, we were pretty prepared for this. Now, of course, it's the, it's the other stuff that none of us were prepared for, which is the fact that we're all sitting at home and, and dealing with things we've never, ever thought we might ever have to deal with. Quite, quite. I'd like to ask about some of those things um, in a few minutes, but uh, let me ask uh, one other question, just to stretch things, just to look ahead a little bit. Uh, what does the fall semester look like for uh, you right now? Is it still completely up in the air, or have you made firm decisions? No firm decisions at this point, um, although, and I guess from that perspective, up in the air, but that we are certainly planning um, for any number of potential contingencies based upon um, what happens. And I don't, I certainly don't have any better idea of what's going to happen than, than anybody else. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. Uh, and many, many universities and colleges are um, right now on that cusp of decision of wondering, you know, we need more data before we can figure out what the fall is going to look like in terms of public health. Well, hang on for a second. Let me see if I can bring up uh, our other guest today. Um, and see if her just had a technology issue. Let's see if we can uh, solve it. Uh, Professor Means. Okay, it looks like your camera and your microphone are still off. Um, so you're going to want to probably just reload the screen. Um, friends, everybody, before we go further, I have a whole stack of questions uh, to ask our guest. And I have a bunch of questions that I'm sure you'd like to ask as well. But the key thing here is for all of us to have a conversation. That's the idea of the town hall metaphor. So if you'd like to join us up here on stage, simply click the raise hand button and you can do that. Or if you'd like to type in a question, just click on the question mark. You can type in your comment or question and we'll bring that up for everybody else. Uh, as uh, we, um, so, and if you have any questions, any questions at all about how this works, again, just use either the uh, question box or the raised hand button, and you can ask. Uh, now, one thing I'd like to ask you, um, do you, should I call you Professor uh, Feldstein, Provost Feldstein, or Andrew? Andrew works. Very good, very good. Uh, one thing I'd like to ask you about this present term uh, is since you will, you're not making a, a huge leap from nothing online to entirely online. What you described as making a kind of shift in emphasis from partially online to wholly online. Uh, what are some of the uh, practices and habits that you've established over your years of teaching online that you think are especially useful that other colleges and universities could learn from? Well, I mean, I think that the, that the primary most important piece is a matter of connection. Um, over the years, I think the philosophy of, of our team and, and of the university as a whole is that online learning is not just delivering content. It's, it's more about conversations. It's more about connections. It's more about forming. Uh, it's discussing things and learning through that process as opposed to just simply um, saying, here's a, here's a textbook, here's a test, uh, have a nice day. And I think that's a key element. And, and I, I think in this process, as we moved 
to, to remote teaching, our goal was how do we translate that? How, how do we make connections still happen without transitioning these courses to online in the traditional online sense? In other words, we weren't about to, when we design online courses, those are designed extremely differently than our face-to-face -face courses. They're designed primarily um, in an asynchronous mode. Most of our online student population are taking online courses because they work and they're busy and they can't fit into a, 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 a 10 o'clock in the morning class schedule. So it takes, you know, months of development for us to build good, tight, asynchronous courses that match that, you know, that have um, matching specific learning objectives to uh, specific activities and specific assessments, but also involve having a lot of interaction involved so that there's there's so that the students are participating in that learning process we as we started thinking about what to do in this case it was to say okay we can't realistically redesign all of our courses by next tuesday which was a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago or a couple of years ago I, time is sort of lost yeah. uh, meaning but so it was a matter of what is the best way for us to mimic the processes that we were doing in face to face. And um, we've come to rely very heavily on on synchronous environments. Um, Zoom has done a lot of heavy lifting for us mm -hmm. this semester. We looked at the numbers recently and as early as January, we had, and I know January is not, not a particularly busy month, but uh, Fort Hayes hosted somewhere south of 400 Zoom meetings in January. In, as of, in April, as of, and I haven't looked in the last few days, but as of about the 15th of April, we were well north of, of hosting 5,000 meetings. So we we're on the way to hosting close to 10,000 meetings, if not more for this month, most of which, well, Yes, a lot of a lot of them were meetings. Most of all, most all our meetings have gone online. But I'm pretty sure that most of that was classroom activity, and faculty <laughs> moved their courses onto Zoom. And I guess we were fortunate because when we left campus, everybody had a schedule, and we basically told everybody, "Stick with your schedule. If you had a class at eleven o'clock in the morning." Now's not the time to say, hey, let's do it at two in the afternoon, because some of those students had a course at two in the afternoon. So, life, life. so a lot of things that we did were, were really designed to try to, 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 to keep connection with the students and keep continuity with the courses as they were before we left campus. So continuity, uh, both of uh, schedule and uh, also of uh, the uh, sense of connection with students really, really is crucial how you did this. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and that's one thing um, that we, and we learned that very early on. And I don't know if you, we started this process earlier than most people. And, and we started this earlier than most people in late January when we learned that we, we have two, we, we work with two universities in China. And um, we have traditionally, for, for a number of years, we have faculty that go to China and teach face-to-face -face courses to thousands of students. Yeah. And in January, we learned that wasn't going to happen. Right. And that because, and it, it seems bizarre now how foreign we thought the situation was. I mean, imagine, if you will, an entire country telling their students not to come back to campus and to stay home. Matt, Is that crazy or what? How could that happen? How could that possibly happen? And, you know, and when we looked at it, I'll have to say that I'll admit to the fact that when you think of this abstractly as something that's happening someplace else, it doesn't sound as stark as it really is once you figure it out so when we started that process 
my the, the main concerns that I had as we were trying to do this is a we have faculty that aren't used to teaching online, unlike our faculty on campus. We have students who aren't used to taking courses online. And we had the third factor of the uncertainty of the technology technology and the infrastructure we were going to be able to use in China. We knew that there were certain things that we just weren't going to be able to use at all. We knew that anything that had to do with Google, including YouTube videos, wasn't going to work. Right. Um, we were concerned about Zoom because there were some there had been some issues with Zoom going in. And so one of the things that we had initially tried to do was to try to make this as bulletproof and as low tech as possible. Um, Interesting. Of course, another piece of information came in at that point, which was we weren't the only ones that were bringing our Chinese partner students online. All of their courses were going online. And domestically, that is China domestically, the decision had been made to use a platform, um, which is ostensibly, it was a MOOC platform. And so we discovered as we were in the process of developing, and we had three weeks, by the way, to develop these courses before the beginning of the semester, the total of, for the first semester, we had 40 plus courses, 140, 150 sections. Uh, so putting this together was, it, it was a bit of a race. But when we discovered that they were using MOOC platforms there, we had to consider the fact that domestically their experience was going to be mostly watching streaming video yes which is what they were going to be doing with maybe a more generic discussion board component and we weren't we hadn't originally thought about introducing a lot of video because we were unsure of the inconsistency of delivery uh, we once we learned what their experience was going to be, we knew we needed to make ours a little closer to that. So we were able to, we used, uh, we, we were fortunate to have Blackboard hosted in China. Wow. So yeah, that was something we worked on for quite a while, but we, we, this was the first year, actually the second full semester we had Blackboard hosted in China. So what we decided to do was to take the videos from our video platform, and upload them into Blackboard as MP4s so that we could try to avoid some of the issues with the potential streaming issues with VidGrid, which is our uh, video provider. Uh, and so we put all that in place. At the end of the day, and I think the most important piece of this is when we finished the, the initial part of the process and we had designed the courses and we had everything ready to go and we had designed what we felt were, were really good solid courses, the first thing we heard from students is, where's my professor? Hmm. I see the video. I want to see my professor. We, we, uh, uh, uh. We're, 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 the, the, there was a cry for normalcy. There was, a, there was a cry for the fact we need to connect with one another at this point. And it was something that we began to appreciate once, once we started getting this feedback, which quite frankly, we should have appreciated before that if we had, or if I had had a sense that what the reality of everybody goes home and everybody sits wherever they are in their house and is pretending like everything is normal because they were doing that in China two months before we were doing it. And so having learned through that process, we immediately ramped up the the pieces of the puzzle that could connect faculty to students and can connect students together to try to uh, we we employed WeChat as part of the process and and did all, and Zoom got ramped up pretty well because you know I I, start, I think about you know Maslow's hierarchy yes you know and and unless you've got if you're if you're hungry and you don't have a roof over your head and you don't know where you're going to be in the next minute in time and you don't know whether you're safe, you couldn't possibly be concerned with whatever content it is in the course that you're taking. Right. Let me let me pause you for one second because this is a fantastic story and I really hope that um, that you publish this uh, in, a, in a full account because you, you have this extraordinary position of being in the first wave before everybody else. 
of having to bring your Chinese campuses uh, online with the unusual situation of having a hosted Blackboard. And so many, uh, so many themes have come up. I, I, I want to bring, I want to hit those themes, but I want to give a few people a chance to um, uh, pop in. Uh, so first of all, uh, we have uh, one other person. Let's see if we can get our other guest online right now. Hello, Professor Means. I'm, I'm seeing, hello, we can see you. Your, your microphone is muted though. So you wanna try fixing that in settings to make sure that uh, the mic can work. Um, I'll give you a minute to do that. Um, we have a, a whole series of questions have been coming in, uh, Andrew. I just wanna give people a chance, I will give you a chance to, uh, uh, to uh, respond to them. Uh, the first has come in from uh, Jeremiah Perry Hill, and we just flashed this on the screen. Uh, and he's at uh, RIT, and he asks, do you have any favorite model for a playbook to get faculty to rapidly develop community, accountability, and trust in online class? Let me bring that back up. So for community, accountability, and trust in online class. Um, well, good question. The, I mean, I, I don't know a specific playbook. I mean, we work from, I, I mean, community of inquiry framework is pretty well central to what we do. And if there's a playbook, it, it has to do with the three presences in the community of inquiry framework. Can you, you know, explain for people who haven't seen that framework yet? Uh, community of inquiry framework, um, it was developed by Garrison and folks actually somewhere around late 90s. Um, and it basically talks about when you're when you're in a face to face class, there are certain things that happen organically and naturally in a face to face class. Um, and what they've done in this framework is they've broken it down into three presences and they one is teaching presence. One is social presence and the third is cognitive presence. And the way I tend to look at it is sort of as a formula. Whereas if you have teaching presence along with social presence, it leads to cognitive presence, which is more of the, the interactive learning process. But teaching presence is the piece that we consider and think of. Those are the syllabus. Those are the due dates. Those are the processes that you think of as what you as, as, a, as a faculty member will bring to a class. Uh, we don't normally think about social presence, which in an online environment, that is somehow the hidden less obvious thing because social presence is that piece that just happens. It's the classroom itself. When you walk into a classroom, there are visual cues. Um, there are there are cues, there are sound cues. When you see the professor up in front of the room, posture and tone of voice are all part of what you're, you're of the connection that's being made. As the instructor, you get to see what you get you get to see feedback from students. You get to see, ah, that person is just nodded off on their desk. Maybe I need to pick up the pace a little bit. That person is looking like I'm from Mars. Maybe I need to explain this a little bit more. So all of these social factors, which happen naturally in a face-to-face -face classroom, do not appear at all online. There's a vacuum unless you introduce social presence. And social presence goes back to when I was just talking a minute ago about China. That was the piece that we really needed to bump up as we started getting the students telling us they wanted they wanted more connection. Uh, when we talk about various, uh, the, the social presence is the piece that allows us to process the content and the teaching stuff. You know, I, one of the examples I often use with instructors as we're developing new courses is, you know, you need to have opportunities for feedback and you need to not only provide up channels for feedback between instructors and students, you need to provide opportunities for students to feedback with one another. In a face-to-face -face class, if, you're, if you have given a, a lecture and the topic is particularly difficult and you ask for questions and you know that everybody should have questions and nobody has questions, what actually happens is when everybody gets up and walks out the room, they start turning to one another and say, what in the world just happened? 
right. what was going on in that class? What do we do now? I'm sinking. Now, in an online class, they aren't walking out of the class to have that discussion. So what happens? They start to feel like, okay, I'm crazy. I'm the only one that didn't get this. I don't belong in this class. And bad things start happening at that point. We need to, as we develop online classes, develop these channels of communication. They need to be, you know, we're talking about community building and community building in a class involves creating a learning community where all of the, where the students not only have an opportunity to interact with faculty, but they have an opportunity to interact with one another as part of the you know, process, their thoughts. And once you have this social piece added into the basic dry syllabus type teaching present stuff, this is where where th this is like where, where things start to happen, where people can actually start to process and think about things that leads to actual learning. And that's well, so well. as opposed to a playbook is to go back to the I mean, the I think all of those things, when we talk about creating a community, that's where trust and accountability and connections come in. Well, well, first, well first, thank you. Thank you. Fantastic fantastic answer. Answer. And, uh, and uh, thank you, thank you as well for the great question. Uh, we have more questions that are piling in. And uh, friends, if you want to join us up here on stage and uh, and speak face to face with Andrew and I, just click the raise hand button and, and you can do that. Uh, this is from Gene Myers at uh, also New York, University of Buffalo. And he would like to know, I'm curious about the various approaches to handling synchronous versus asynchronous events. Some faculty are trying to enforce their former face to face time frame. That seems to be difficult in this setting. And, and we're experiencing that. We have, as I said earlier, we made the decision when everybody left campus to tell faculty to keep with your schedule. Because this was a middle of semester event, there were already, I mean, habits were formed and people had an expectation of courses. Now that doesn't mean that all of our students are going to be able to attend those events. What most faculty are doing is they're hitting the record button on their Zoom meetings so that students can watch them later. Now, I, in full disclosure, I will tell you that in normal times, that is not something I even think about recommending. Because a Zoom meeting, it, it has its place, and, one, and, and its place is, to, is not just to deliver content, but you're creating connections in that environment. And because people have a chance to, to see one another and they have a chance to see somebody nod their head and, and facial expressions and all those things. If you are watching a Zoom meeting after the fact, there's this yeah. barrier there. It's not, it's, it's not, there's the less a sense of immediacy and connections because you're watching a rerun of it. You miss those people that were there. A, there's a kind of a tension, a tension that that comes there um one of one of the things we've talked to faculty about this semester is adding asynchronous pieces that they wouldn't necessarily have thought of um working with things like yellow dig boards and 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 having discussions so that students have an outlet to communicate with one another in ways that they may not have considered before or even to leverage to leverage if they've been using a board before you know, before, before coronavirus, and they're still using a board now, maybe extend what that board is doing. Maybe, maybe give the students a, a channel in that to, to sort of debrief one another and, and just to talk to one another about things. I want to make sure, I want to make sure, I want to make sure the asynchronous. 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 But we had a, we had a question, question before them. Before them. One is, one a, is a, Strategic question uh, from and this is a sort of um, positioning question. He asks, the question of promoting affinity is rising in many campuses. How do you differentiate your online offering from other institutions so you connect with students and learners so they feel connected? Now, I'll bring that back up again so you can say it. Well, I think, I, again, we potentially, 
and are are and were more prepared to do this than a good number of institutions because this is what we do i mean my my unit which is teaching innovation and learning technologies works with faculty on a daily basis to build really tight well connected online courses you know go back to the community of inquiry framework go back to the the idea of of learning communities and creating a collaborative environment for students that's something that we strive to do all the time and what typically happens and is one of the more rewarding parts of, of our job is since we have many of our faculty the they're they're designing courses for online at the same time they're potentially teaching that same course face to face and what tends to happen is once they've developed their online course taught that online course they come back to me and say all right let's discuss how we're going to take what we've done online and move that into my face-to-face -face course because what they're seeing is a lot of the things that that we are building into the online courses are the collaborative pieces they're the feedback pieces they're the they're the pieces that, that are connecting not just faculty with students but students with students in meaningful knowledge building ways that comes back to the uh idea of learning communities um we have a that's a great question Matt, and, and a, a really solid answer uh andrew i love how it's crowded in pedagogy as well as uh, student life uh we have two questions that are really close to each other and they refer back to something uh that you described in in um transitioning campuses in china so let me just quickly bring these up because i uh they're very close to each other um and this is from uh kelly otter uh, who's another dean, and she asks, given firewall issues, how feasible do you think it would be for other institutions to use an LMS to connect with students in China who are unable to return to campus in the summer and fall? That is, I've been getting that question a lot. I've been getting a lot of calls from various universities that are, that are trying to solve that issue. I don't believe that we would have been as successful as we are this semester had we not had Blackboard being hosted in China. Oh. Um, we have traditionally had issues. There, there was a point prior to that where we were uh, on a managed hosting Blackboard solution in Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't go well. The, the, the lag was, there was, there was a lot of lag um, a lot of things wouldn't load. Uh, you know, people are used to the internet working, uh, regardless of whether you're in China or here, you're used to a page loading in, in a nanosecond. I mean, could you imagine if a page took three seconds to load now? Imagine then if that same page takes a minute or more to load and the, the frustration is going to be high. Um, I don't know an easy way to, to do that. I mean, going low tech, sadly, is, is, is a possible solution. But the problem with that, as we found out again early on, was that if you don't have the ability to connect with the students, none of this is going to work very well. And so, yeah, that is yeah. a problem that's top of mind. I don't have a solution for it yet, unfortunately. We have our hosting in China and haven't needed to deal with that yet. Well, let me hold on to that thought for a second because we have uh, a, a related question, uh, but this comes from the other side of the planet. Uh, and this is uh, from uh, Matthew Pluer. Um, and he asks, um, in Canada, we're trying to get China and the US to have no hand in what we do. Anyone else having these concerns about privacy and national boundaries is at Université Laval. Well, they're always going to ha have a hand uh, because they've just by they've limited your ability to use certain things. Period. Again, no YouTube, no Google, no Gmail. Um, anything that has even a web page that you have that might have a Google search bar in it isn't going to load. So, from from that perspective, there's no way to prevent that from happening. 
Well, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I can speak back about 18 years ago. There were a lot of questions about how the Patriot Act would apply to other uh, uh, universities in other nations, because if, if they were using, say, a Blackboard hosted service that was hosted in the U.S., would that extraterritorial content then be susceptible to Patriot Act uh, oversight because the servers are in the U.S.? The international complexities of this are, 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 are quite strong, and uh, I'm impressed at you using a, a, a Singapore server for a while. That's a that's definitely a very 21st century thing to do. Uh, we have a couple of people up here I want to bring back, but I want to try and get Tanya back up. Uh, Professor Means? Hi there. Hello. Can you it's hear working. me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Beautiful. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you, so Thank you for your patience. It's so good to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, if all else fails, turn it off and turn it back on. That works. <laughs> well, let, let, let me bring you into the conversation. First of all, have you been able to hear at least yes. part of it? Good, 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 good. Yes. And let me ask you a question, which is, where are you today? Well, I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska. Oh, great. Is it uh, is spring finally there? It is. We're finally starting to get spring. Although we, we built a snowman a few days ago. So <laughs> I, I my I I I think nobody appreciates spring like people in the North Country. Uh, yes. <laughs> and and let me ask you, how is how has your institution been doing with this migration over the past month in this extraordinary time? Well, it you know, it's been really fascinating to be a part of the planning committee that has been working on our academic plans and, and how we can, uh, we moved very quickly to go from thinking about um, what was coming and how we could help with continuity to now even trying to figure out ways that we can leverage the innovations that people have had through this process to continue to innovate and to continue to enhance our online and in-person courses. So really looking strongly at how can we be blended, how can we um, use this opportunity to pivot towards a more meaningful, human-centered, learner-centered uh, uh, environment for our students. Human-centered. I mean, this is such a, it's, it seems like a, almost a contradiction for, uh, for some to think about using so much technology, but at the same time using it for, uh, for human purposes. Uh, there's, a, there's a nice echo back with our conversation so far about the importance of, of human connection. Um, can, can I repeat my question that I posed to Andrew before? About Absolutely. The have you, yeah. has, has your institution made a decision about fall uh, semester yet? So we haven't made any decisions about fall, but we're definitely in the process of contingency planning and we're trying to look at all the different possible scenarios. So we've come up with about nine different scenarios of what could happen, everything from fully online to fully remote to some sort of combination of um, remote and in-person. And so we're trying to figure out how can we use those different scenarios to plan ahead and to do some, some contingency planning? My biggest thing is just trying to figure out how can we leverage technology to allow us to be agile, to, be al to allow us to be able to serve the needs of our students regardless of which way we have to offer our courses, what the modality is. Well, agility is really the name of the game right now. Um, well. We've had a whole stack of good questions uh, that have taken us everything from uh, marketing to pedagogy to faculty support to geopolitics, uh, which is a, a great sign of uh, the participants involved in our conversation. But I want to, and, and we've touched a whole series of issues, um, and I, I want to come back to one in particular. Uh, Andrew mentioned this, and I want to give you both the chance to uh, uh, to address it. We talked about synchronous teaching and learning and using video. And of course, right now we're, we're using it as, as an example of that. But asynchronous camp in a few ways. Um, one, the idea of providing feedback, of, of giving peers the ability to connect with each other. Um, and I'm wondering if, if Assistant Dean means, if you could start us off by describing some of the ways you're using asynchronous technology. And then, sure. Andrew, if we could circle back to you to, uh, to hear more, more about that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to do that. One of the things that we were able to bring on um, fairly, well, actually, this is quite a bit before we had to, to deal with the challenges of, of remote instruction was we, we brought Yellow Dig in uh, quite a while ago to start giving students opportunities to build communities around topics that they were discussing within the content. 
Um, we've since moved into kind of a, a way of trying to figure out how can we blend the synchronous and asynchronous and how can we use technology to do that. Um, Andrew mentioned at one point uh, recording a, a synchronous meeting and then allowing people to watch afterwards. One of the ways that we've overcome that barrier or that wall of feeling like you're watching a rerun and you can't really interact is to, within the video itself of the recorded live session, pose the same kinds of questions to students that you posed in that meeting. So if I'm doing, I can describe what I did Monday night in class. We have, you know, 40 some students in the class. We have about 20 who show up for the synchronous session. We yeah. record the session. Um, and during that session, we pose students, uh, pose to the students a set of questions that they then go into breakout rooms and discuss. The breakout rooms are not recorded, but they come back and report on what their groups discussed, or we create an artifact or both. So an artifact could be a set of Google Slides or a Google Doc or some kind of collaboratively created content. Then for the recording, we pose those same questions on the video timeline and collect the responses from the students who are watching it after the fact and post those on a page where others can view them. So it's a way to still get that interaction and still get that um, seeking for your input as a participant without it having to be synchronous or live. Fascinating. How do you, how do you technically, how do you share all those artifacts? So we use Vidgrid, just like Andrew mentioned, we use Vidgrid and there's a, a way to add a question within the timeline. That question then collects the responses. We get the responses and post them on a Canvas page. So sometimes it'll be a couple of paragraphs, sometimes it'll be a couple of sentences from each person who's watching it, but it gives them an opportunity to share their part of what they would have input if they were part of the conversation live. Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you. And, and I should ask, what class was it? Oh, the class is uh, our capstone course for our MBA program on strategic management. Uh -huh. What a great subject to be studying now. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let's 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 think about this, and then uh, Andrew, um, do you do something similar? Or do you do something different? And before that, are you are you teaching this term? I am not teaching this term. What, what do you normally teach when they let you in the class? Uh, marketing courses. Very good, very good. So let's, let's share your your thoughts on the asynchronous technologies and the use of asynchronous pedagogy. What are you up to? What do you see working? Well, I mean, for me, it. Most of this, it's it's not specifically about tools and platforms. It's about processes and trying to create. We 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 try to start. And this is again. This is this is the conversation we have when we're developing any of the courses. What do you want to do? Not what is this platform here and how can we take this and do something? I mean, interestingly, if you think about. Um, synchronous just for a second and you're thinking about we do have blackboard collaborate which is designed as a classroom based synchronous collaborative tool we also have zoom we have seen far greater usage of zoom than we have blackboard collaborate because it's simpler yeah and yeah. because there is no learning curve and because the immediacy of the situation outweighed anybody's desire to to go over to learn something new or to or to get something that might be more pedagogically um, structured. So simplicity takes a play and 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 pretty much with anything that we look at we to go to to the to the asynchronous piece, it it's really a matter of, in any case, thing about what what are you looking to do? Are you looking are you looking to build um, a group project? Uh, are you looking to build uh, to have individuals do their own projects and yet work together to think about so that everybody can reflect with one another and do that? And that depends. Okay, maybe you know, will Yellow Dig work for this particular instance? Will I need a blog if we're build, if everyone's building out their own stuff? What is what are the processes that we're looking 
to, to take place? Is feedback more important than content delivery? Is collaboration more important than feedback? And, and then make decisions on those things. So a, a lot of it has to do, and I will go back to the to learning communities again. If we decide to create a learning community, and that's and what I teach, that's uh, somewhere around week three or so, I know that I've won when everybody starts referring to the class as a learning community. And when everybody starts behaving as if it is a learning community, as opposed to a delivery system. That's a sharp difference. Learning community versus, and this this is a fantastic bridge to a, a topic that uh, I think in many ways we're, we're gathered here today to address. Um, how do we successfully make that transition from thinking about uh, distance learning, remote instruction, alternative modes of delivery as a technology, as a platform? And how do we make the transition away from that to actually forming community? Uh, I mean, Andrew, you're describing getting people to think about themselves as members of a learning community. Uh, yeah. And I think that's crucial and combining the synchronous and the asynchronous together. And I wonder if, if Tanya, if I may, how do you see this work? How do you achieve community uh, in this extraordinary environment? Well, I think it comes back to what I talked about, about that human centered environment. If the instructor is modeling the behavior of reaching out to the students and seeking their input and doing more than just trying to deliver a broadcast, but doing more of the back and forth and interaction. You know, we talk about student to student interaction, student to instructor interaction, and student to content interaction. We can't have it be just focused on how do I get them the content. It has to be much more around how do I get people to appreciate each other? And some of that's gonna be that social presence that Andrew talked about. Some of it's going to be that cognitive presence of recognizing that you need other people in order to learn. And some of it's going to be around how you build that appreciation for you as a human and your experiences and how they relate to what we're learning, but also that self-reflection capability of looking at what do I need to know, what, what's my investment into that community, and how can I participate fully? And so if we're constantly trying to connect people to each other, then we start seeing that engagement build because I'm invested in you, I care about you, and I want to know more about what your experiences are or what you're learning. That's a fantastic answer. Uh, that's a really, really good answer. Um, I, I think between the two of you, you've articulated beautifully uh, how we can use not just technologies, but also our practices uh, to establish learning communities and a sense of, of community and togetherness within classes. Now, let, let me ask you to scale that up a bit. Uh, how do you how do you see your students as well as your faculty and staff forming a sense of institutional community? Uh, you know, they can't physically go to campus. I know, Andrew, they didn't always in your case, but but just think this through. I mean, they can't always bump into each other in the parking lot or you know, depending on your campus, be in the same dorm or whatever. Um, how do you how do you build that larger sense of overall community for your universities? That's a good question. And, and it's something that I think people have, their attempts are being made. Um, people are having more, I, I know this isn't necessarily a good thing in any world, but people are having more meetings. Um, <laughs> now I, I have, you know, I, we used our staff meetings with my team of, of 10, we would meet typically have a meeting once every other week we we started this thing with with three days a week and we've scaled back to two days a week but and much of that it's not because we have business that needs to be conducted that needs to 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 take up extra meetings it's to say hello oh. you know you walk down the hall you you just the 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 act of walking past someone's office and and, and smiling as you look in the office can't happen now how do we how do we do that? You know, we have uh, one of the things that we're also doing is we're we're leveraging Microsoft Teams at this point to open on my desktop all the time and 
somebody has a question, they pop in. Somebody has a comment, they pop in. We had a, it was a, a very long Wednesday, I think it was, and somewhere around four o'clock, um, I popped in with a with a fairly innocuous question into Teams, and all of a sudden Teams blew up, and everybody's in there, and the conversation went to coffee and not being able to go to Starbucks, and how are we dealing with the coffee prices um, when we can't go out and get our afternoon coffee, and, and it was just, everybody was in there, and zero business was conducted, but it was more important than that, and I think that we're starting to see that we're going to need to figure out how to how to create those informal channels in places we've never done before ad hoc serendipitous and uh tanya i have to say i'm getting kind of blown away by andrew's sure technological heft um so he, he's mentioned using blackboard collaborate he's mentioned zoom he's using shindig and on the side he's doing microsoft teams I, <laughs> I don't think this is the marketing professor. I think you've seen the, the, the IT master at work. <laughs> well, I think we've all become better adept at not only more technologically savvy. Okay, so yes, yeah, some of us are getting that. But we've also, I think, given each other more grace to allow us to recognize that we didn't start out being good at this and we need to help each other. And so that, you know, you, you take something that, happened innately in the environment just being able to see each other and say hi and and that kind of thing and you take it away to such a point where people now start to recognize i needed that i'm i'm lonely i miss this you know casual interaction and we start building that in because we're humans we start building that into other things we do uh, last week my team and i we um, we got into a meeting in teams and we played a crossword puzzle together I mean, who would have ever thought that that was part of your work environment? But the thing is, is it's necessary. We need that social component. We need that human connection. We need opportunities when we turn on our videos and we interact with each other because we don't have it and we recognize that we don't have it. And so I think the more that we're able to, um, you know, appreciate what we have and appreciate what we need and then build that community around the interactions that we have and recognize that it doesn't all have to be business. In fact, it's better if it's not all business. So it's not just about the task, but it's about the people that you're doing the task with. I can definitely see that. Um, I love the idea of doing a crossword puzzle together. Uh, I never use the word emu quite so often. Uh, when doing <laughs> we, we have questions which just come in building on this. This is what happens in, in, in this kind of conversation. Uh, questions pounce on top of each other. And uh, this is from Diana uh, uh, uh from the University of Buffalo. And she asks, do you have any suggestions for building community in a mass enrolled class? For example, a class size of 100, 600 plus? Uh, that's a great question. I actually do have a few suggestions. Um, one of them is to, to recognize that if you were in a real environment where there were 600 plus people in the room, you would never even expect that you would get to know all those 600 people. Mm. That's not what would happen in reality. We don't go to a football game and expect to be friends with everyone around us. We do expect that the people right in our circle around us who are cheering for the same team, who are interacting with each other, who we expect that to become a little community. And so instead of thinking about how do I build community in my 600 person class, think of it as more, how do I build a connection between one person and another five? or another 10? How do I help that one person feel connected and each person feel connected to a few people? And so that's where I think some of these tools like Yellow Dig, if you can break it into groups or like breakout rooms, if you're doing a Zoom meeting, that's where those have great value is because you can say, we're gonna take our class of 20 people, we're gonna break it into groups of three, you're gonna go into those breakout rooms and you're gonna have a real conversation. Yeah because it's important for you to feel connected to just a few other people so that you feel like you belong. And there are different types of connection as well. I mean, when you think about that class of 600, I mean, one of the scary things, I, I, when I saw 600, I started thinking about MOOCs and, and, I, and I started developing an itch. Um, 
<laughs> but I mean, MOOCs, I think, you know, and I, by and large, think that they've been less successful than they ought because they don't have any real good, most of them, connection mechanisms where where people can really actually meaningfully communicate with, with the people they need to communicate with. I think if you've got 600 people, uh, one way is to, to maybe try to create more connections is to have the instructor or the TAs in the course highlighting certain students and what they're doing and bringing them to the fore and, and, and highlighting activities that are taking place so others have an opportunity to, to again, to, to model what they're doing or to get ideas that they would normally get if it was a smaller class, along with the, you know, the breaking groups out and, and trying to create groups of people, but just having general general yet specific feedback, general yet specific contributions that are strategically placed as part of the, the classroom process. Contributions and feedback. Um, this is terrific stuff. And a, a question bubbled up uh, from uh, uh, Ava Steffener, and, and it kind of anticipates your, your answers. Uh, she had asked, do you notice that you're losing students with this online transition? And if so, do you have any strategies for reconnecting to those students? And I, I think what you've both described for community building at different scales is a way to not lose some students. But how, how do you go after the ones who have uh, who've dropped off the radar? Well, one of the, oh, sorry, Andrew. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say one of the fascinating things that we uh, can do is that once we all are on technology, we have so much data that we can mine to figure out who's getting lost. And yeah. so in the past, if we had a classroom full of people and we had one person who was just showing up and kind of um, on Facebook and or Netflix on their laptop in the back of the room, we didn't have much insight into that. But now what we have is we can say, well, we know that you haven't logged in recently, or we know that you're late on this assignment. And so we can reach out specifically to those students with some uh, interventions to be able to say, is there anything I can do to help you? And yeah. that's been one of the great things that I have found in working with my students is that as I notice that they are, um, that the analytics are showing that they might be in trouble, if I can then reach out to them in a very, uh, person-centered, human-centered uh, way and say, look, I care about you and I see that you're you're struggling. What can I do to help you? And in that way, I'm able to kind of rescue some of those students that I would never have been able to, to recognize before. One of the amazing things that, that we've done here at Fort Hayes State is developing care teams. Um, and that's in conjunction with the academic side and advising and, and student affairs. And these are teams of faculty and staff that are charged with making sure that the students aren't getting lost, You're reaching out to the students, to, trying to get a sense and an understanding of what's happening at home. I mean, we know that there are, are, are students that are have gone back to a house where potentially their parents are now at, at, at home working. They have a, a younger brother who's in high school and all four of them need to be on the computer. And yet maybe they have one computer that they have to work with. How do we help those students and, and let them know it's okay and give them an idea of processes that they can use, make sure that their, their, their instructors understand the situation that, that they're in. And our faculty have mirrored this process and they reach out to the care teams. Well, they reach out to students, they send emails. If they're not getting responses back, they reach out to the care teams who then go in and try to reach out. We, we're trying to make sure that as much as possible, we can try to keep everyone together in this process. Well, that's a fantastic thing. That's the first time I've heard of a care team. But, but speaking of care, uh, we are actually at the end of our hour. We have just raced through conversation and uh, several people have, have direct messaged me to say this is a great discussion, but they have a, a meeting to go to. Um, let me let me first of all, thank you both for your incredible work, your insights, your clarity of sharing all of the lessons that you've learned. 
Uh, this is just tremendous, and uh, I'm I'm really grateful. L let me secondly ask, what's the best way for people to keep up with you and your work? Um, do you uh, do you write a newsletter? Or are you on Twitter? Should we follow your main page? What's what's the best way to uh, keep learning from you both? I have to do more of that. <laughs> I, I you know basically I. Yeah, I, I need to start sharing these things out. As as you said earlier, we need to write up the the China experience, and Ooh. most of what I do is what I do. And and yeah, I mean, I'm, I am out there on LinkedIn every once in a while and post something. But uh, other than that, and I had a blog, and I wish I had time to contribute things regularly. But as it is, I'm doing what I do and trying to make sure that um, we have successful students. Well, uh, that sounds like you're definitely doing that. And uh, um, I would suggest exploiting some of those students to uh, to uh, write a write a post. Um, and how about you, Tanya? What's the best way to keep up with you and all this flurry of activity? Yeah, definitely. I'm on LinkedIn. In fact, I, I spend more time on there recently just because I'm seeing a lot of need for people to have some resources and to be able to connect with each other, share ideas. And so I've been on uh, LinkedIn quite a bit. And uh, we do have a blog that we run with the college. Um, haven't posted there most recently just because there's so many other things going on. Um, but when we do post, I, I definitely share those on LinkedIn. Um, I feel like the the best way is these kinds of organizational uh, sessions. I'm part of our business accreditation. We have uh, AACSB has an online learning affinity group, and we regularly run uh, webinars on topics like this. And so we every month on the third Thursday, we have a, a webinar that we do and um, bring people together and try to get people sharing ideas, sharing resources and helping each other. Oh, super, super. Well, that's good advice. And, uh, and that sounds good. We'll look for uh, Tanya Means at uh, LinkedIn. Uh, in the meantime, I have to thank some other people. Let me first of all thank all of you participants. Um, these are terrific questions. Uh, I really, really appreciate um, sharing all of your thoughts from your wide range of perspectives, including multiple national backgrounds and professional backgrounds. And I'd also like to thank Yellow Day uh, for uh, hosting and sponsoring this session. Uh, we're really grateful to you for doing mm -hmm. that. Uh, speaking of which, we have two more sessions uh, in the pipeline. Uh, we have one coming up um, on uh, May 6th, and we have another one coming up on May 19th. Um, both of those are at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, uh, so we'd love to have you with us then. Uh, in the meantime, uh, thanks again to all our participants. Thanks to the two splendid guests. Thanks to Yellow Dig, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank everybody. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.